five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the panel. Uh, I've just got a couple of cleanup questions for a couple of different folks as we come to the end of this first round. Uh, Mr. Heifetz, we'll start with you. You've been asked a couple times by a couple of different people, how is it po in fact, several folks have been asked, how could it be possible that somebody going someplace on business could be a national security interest or national security threat? But I don't think that's your point. Let me see if I'm, if I'm, if I'm correctly articulating your point, and I think Ms. Johnson may have made a similar point, which is that if we interfere with the free travel of, say, a European businessman or woman who has gone to Iran and gone back and then comes into this country, we deny that person the visa waiver program, then that may discourage trade or travel to and from Iran, which would be a violation of the agreement we just signed with Iran a couple weeks ago. Is that your argument, sir? That is an argument as to why discretion with respect to the uh, waiver is, is important. I'll take that as a yes, as lawyers tend to do, but I'll take that as a yes, uh, unless you're telling me it's no. That what you're saying is that because that interpretation of the statute would potentially or likely violate the agreement with Iran, then it's in the national security interest of the United States to do something else because breaching the agreement with Iran is against the national security interest of the United States. That's, yes. Okay. Let me ask you this. What if the bill, what if the law, by the way, signed by the, I mean, passed by the House and the Senate and signed by the President required the President to do something in violation of the JCPOA? Would it still qualify as a national security exemption, a waiver under this law? Could the President break the law in order to not break the JCPOA? I have a hard time uh, envisioning this scenario that, that perhaps you're envisioning. The, the, uh, we the, pass a bill today that says that it is illegal for anybody who's traveled to, the, to Iran to come into the United States for a year. We pass that law today. And Can the president waive that law under subsection C in the, out of the, in the name of the national security interest of the United States? If, if there's a, an exempt, if there's a waiver authority for national security and the, the administration determines that it's in the national security interest to waive it, then it's not a violation of the law. No, but, if the, but it's a violation of the separate law that we may have passed. Again, take my example. We pass a bill today. We go in the House, the Senate, the President signs it. It says, if you go to Iran, you can't come here for a year. Could the President waive that law under subsection C? in your mind? If, if the administration determines that it's in the national security interest of the United States, then yes. I, and I, I think that's right. I think that's consistent with your position. But my point is, I, I start to get my, the hair on the back of my neck stands up when we say it's okay for the president to break the law uh, in order to accomplish something. So, but anyway, that's, uh, again, I think we're just clarifying um, the, uh, a couple questions that were asked before. A, a question about process. Um, if I am that Iranian businessman and I go to Iran and then I come back, excuse me, I'm a, I'm a British business person, I go to Iran and I come back and then I want to come to the United States, how do we know that I've been to Iran? This is probably a better question okay. for, uh, for some of the others, but I, my understanding is that, there, that the fields are expanding, that the ESTA uh, fields are expanding to uh, ask that uh, to okay. get at that issue. That's, 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 that's one possible answer. It's not the best answer. The best answer would be that the computer systems would know that we're sharing information with the British. Because if I lie on the ETSA, or however you pronounce it, then am I going to get caught? Do we share information with the British on that? We do. Uh, okay. It's in the travel records, and it's in either the name information or the advanced data. But then, of course, there's another way, and that is if you then enter the United States or you happen to be trying to enter the United States through Dublin or Abu Dhabi, you would show to a United States Customs and Border Protection officer a passport who would go through the pages of that passport and see the stamp or see the information that you had been to one of those four countries. And that's what we did during the Ebola uh, uh, issue of those impacted countries. Okay, and then I'm stopped at the border if that's the case. You're denied, you're denied entry because you had that travel within after 2011. Thank you. Now, to a, another point, and I'm going to ask Ms. Vaughn a question that I promise, Mr. Chairman, I'll wrap up. Um, because we talked about this hypothetical business person. We've talked, um, I think Mr. Heifetz in his testimony mentions a couple different 
um, folks. Mr. Heifetz, I will read from yours. It says, It is common and will become ever more common for a European business person to travel to Iran to conduct legitimate business. I think we all agree with that. But if that European business person's travel will preclude further travel to the United States under the VWP, that might deter European dealings business dealings with Iran, then you then go on to talk about the Australian doctor who might also be deterred from going to the Middle East in order to provide services. Ms. Vaughan, you, someone told me before you used to work in the Foreign Service. Okay. That's right. Um, I'll ask you first, and I'll ask anybody, does anybody really believe that the possibility of getting kicked out of the, of the visa waiver program is going to deter a doctor from going to work in the Middle East? I do not think so, um, and, and certainly not with respect to business. You ever have a doctor you know, ask that? Can I, if I, if I go to this country, right, can like, I still oh, get I in? Yeah. Yeah, I can't go to Disneyland or right. something. I don't think that would deter them. I don't think it would deter a business person if they're pursuing a lucrative business opportunity in Iran or Iraq. $160 and the time of a visa interview is not going to be uh, too much of a cost of business to go take care of that. I think I, it's a mistake to think of these people as victims. I tend to, well, I tend to, I'm not going to get in victimization, but I tend to agree it doesn't discourage them. If anybody else disagree, I'm going to let Mr. Heifetz dif disagree with that because it was his testimony. Does anybody else disagree? Does anybody really think that's a deterrent to travel? Okay, let the record reflect. Nobody said no. Mr. Heifetz, it's your testimony. Why do you think it's a deterrent to travel? Do you have we, any personal experience with that? Yes, we have uh, clients who, uh, it is to address a, another point that arose, uh, I think it is common knowledge that travel history, an individual traveler's travel history is a factor that's taken into account as to whether to grant an ESTA and whether to grant entry to the United States, and, and properly so. Um, we have been asked uh, with some frequency whether travel to a particular location will cause difficulties entering the United States, and the answer to that uh, is it might. Um, and there have been instances in which people have foregone travel because of that concern. So I, I would expect that uh, there would be instances in which people uh, decline the type of travel that we've been discussing if VWP privileges were at risk. Thank you, Mr. Tavich. Thank you to the whole chair. Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, uh, we're going to wrap up. We have. Uh